It worked! The intro video. Four Stoked weeks. to be part of the first live where the intro works. <laughs> Four weeks into these weekly live streams and you know what? The intro video worked. The audio is great. And uh, thanks for joining. Welcome to Art in the Heart Live. Uh, today I'm joined by Matthew van der Poeter. Uh, Matt, we go Close. back quite a few years. Um, yeah, a couple uh, of conferences. Yeah, a few conferences, a few videos, um, chatting about and, and all sorts. Uh, if you guys haven't seen our previous videos, um, we've done a few collaborations before uh, on the channel and a few photo shoots out and about in London and, and whatnot. Um, but it's actually, it's been a while since we've hung out. Obviously, we've had five months of lockdown <laughs> recently in I the reckon, UK. Yeah, it must have been like six months ago, seven months. Uh, I think no, it's, One of my it, last little photo missions out, out and about until everything just kind of went downhill again sadly. yeah um that was that was in july i want to say maybe even yeah. august um so yeah it, it's been a while but how you doing matt what's uh yeah what's good i mean generally decent hopeful about the near and further future uh but right now i uh i'm in a lot of pain i just pulled my back again i've been struggling with lower back issues for about six months now and i think i just made it worse so oh, no. neutral you know count all things up uh, neutral maybe yeah <laughs> but i'm happy to be here i'm stoked uh you asked me last week um it's funny how there's like a, a big rise in in live streams i think and it's nice to see you know pros doing it because there's a lot of crappy ones but um you know people like yourself and i like to count myself in the better live stream uh <laughs> live streamers as well it's nice when it all looks professional and when the intro works and uh Get some people in the chat, get some viewers. Well, you say that, but yeah. we've had we've had all sorts of technical difficulties on on various live streams. Um, but I think that that is technical difficulties that have come from the fact that it's all fun setting it all up. And uh, this has been so enjoyable for me. And the the idea of live streams, I, I think you probably feel the same because uh, I mean, you've been doing weekly for like the last month or so, I think. Mm -hmm. um, the way that I feel about it is I, I desperately want to go out and film videos. Obviously, we can't really do that too much right now. Um, and at some point, I want to be doing these live streams and in-person events as well. That's kind of the the dream and the overall goal of it. Like a like a live stream with an F. Yeah, <laughs> where you're running around. Yeah, that um, would be cool. Yeah. But uh, without being able to to go out and make the videos and kind of struggling on inspiration, motivation at times, um, doing the live streams is a way of holding myself accountable week by week and and doing it. Um, but I, I should say, actually, I went and filmed a video the other day, uh, nice relaxing one, easy one, and I uh, should be editing that and publishing that cinematic um, chill vibes, or is there a mission to it? Uh, or what's the, uh... Let's call it chatty chill vibes. Um, yeah. that'll be the, the idea. Um, jelly journey, chatty chill. All the, Joe. yeah, all the ease. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's something that's, um, you know, coming up, but doing the live streams is, is a lot of fun and, um, yeah. The whole idea of Art and the Heart, if you're new here, is to share creators that are in my network who I think are creating art for all the right reasons, doing things that are passionate to them and sharing it with an audience who are eager to learn. Um, if I've just come up with a strap line there, then that's worked out really well. That's um, nice. Yeah, I didn't but, really know that. I know you had the Art and Heart brand going on and there's you know good stuff involved, but I didn't know the specific uh, mission behind it, I guess. So yeah, yeah so it, it's all kind of come about from this idea of there are there are far too many creators who are doing things for, uh, for all the wrong money. reasons, really, clout. You know, doing it. Yeah, for the clout right. for the for the money for the likes, um, you know, just everything. Wait, you of, don't do it for that? Uh, not not externally. <laughs> not for a while. <laughs> um, not externally. Love that. But um, deep down, that's still a big drive, right? Yeah, there is a there's a, a sense of like um, journey with it, I guess, you know, you can see uh, in the same way that when you look back on your work, and if you're not, um, if you don't feel like you're improving on your work, then, you know, or if you're not looking at your work and seeing that it's better now than what it was previously, then there's a chance you're not improving. Uh, likewise, if you're reaching more voices and more audiences, then something's kind of clicking. Uh, but at yeah. the same time, I don't really hold myself too accountable for it. Um, I mean, views on the channel and everything have all been a landslide for the last couple of years. But you know what? I don't care. I still enjoy like a, making the videos. Like a, 
a landslide win or a landslide down in numbers? Uh, think of it like a um, like a cheese rolling contest. Like you'll never catch that cheese. It's it's going down the hill. Um, <laughs> that's a that's a proper UK reference because they do that. Where is that? They do the, it's the in, cheese uh, rolling. It's in Gloucestershire. It's uh, yeah. it's actually near to where I grew up. Um, <laughs> Yeah, did bad. you ever roll the cheese or try to catch the cheese no i, I tried to go desperately uh many times but i was always too late to um to actually reach the event uh because yeah. yeah, i, I want to go and, and document it one year yeah um, the cheese had been rolled by the time you got there it looks dangerous it's um i mean there's so many broken it's bones like, it's lunacy but it's one of those i assume it's just a you know centuries old tradition that is absolutely hilarious yeah and, and the why i don't know the why but i'm glad it's there yeah <laughs> Um, anyway, so Matt, uh, thanks for joining today. Um, to introduce you guys to the audience, if you've not seen those previous videos where I've introduced Matt many times, uh, Matt, you are a true time warper. Uh, you've even got the cap to uh, That's new merch. I, I launched that. that only a few weeks ago. Finally, I have merch. Um, yeah, time warper. I wanted to have a sort of, like, I, I'm a time-lapse photographer on paper, um, but it's more than that because I, you're a time warper as well. You're, you're manipulating time. You're showing things and experiences you're squeezing a whole trip into something of you know four or five minutes long all of that photography is time warping you're, you're capturing stills and i wanted to have some sort of like a branding or a an, a, an umbrella term for people that make visual content mm -hmm. um and then i watched this bts clip about planet earth i think or one of those crazy bbc docos and and they used time warping as a term and then i was like that's cool. I'm going to, I'm going to yeah. take that and run with it. So yeah, uh, so more much now. We've got a little uh, show reel of you. And this is where again, audio technical difficulties may happen, but <laughs> fingers crossed it's going to work. So here's a quick little run through um, of what you're all about. and stuff is that run out of audio that's uh like, that was just black screen from now yeah i didn't didn't trigger the uh didn't trigger the, the scene back um well admittedly we did set up that clip literally 30 seconds before we went live um because we had some issues with sending files and playbacks and nothing interesting for the people watching but <laughs> worth noting we pulled it off <laughs> definitely um it, it's one of those things where having a super fast internet connection makes it um, totally fiber uh Dream come it true, really. Works like quite literally one minute before. Hey Matt, have you got yeah. that file? <laughs> oh no, um, it's a gigabyte. No, it's fine. But um, yeah, Matt, your your work is uh, just continuing to inspire me every year. It seems like I'm, I'm always uh, seeing your show reels and other things, and it, they just continually get better and better. And I wonder if that's something that you feel personally. Um, no. Is that something that you <laughs> you notice Not in your all. work? Um, what was that cheese rolling thing you said i just feel like i've been doing the same thing my cheese has been static it's just been a, it's been sitting there i don't know i feel is that is that part like imposter syndrome is that getting better and getting more experienced and seeing other things and knowing that you know like the more you know about something the more you can be aware of the fact that you don't know everything and mm -hmm. i feel like that's kind of a big part of it of, of creativity in general creators in general um i feel and people hate i always get make people upset when I say this. I don't feel like like a creative. I don't feel like I'm an artist. I know that I'm really good at one thing, mm -hmm. time-lapse photography, which is a technique that I apply to whatever I see or encounter at home or while I travel. I know which settings to use and I know how to edit things so they look good. Yeah. To me, that is just like applying one technique over and over and over again. And yeah, you can get creative and new transitions pop up on the scene and you might get inspired by music or you try to convey a feeling, but I don't feel like I'm constantly evolving. And mm -hmm. if anything, that imposter syndrome and feeling like a fake uh, only gets heavier and more intense when I try new things. Cause I'm just like, I'm literally just trying to make stuff up mm -hmm. to stand out from the crowd. Yeah. Um, 
so yeah, I don't know. I mean, we can we can talk for hours about this, I'm sure, because everybody recognizes those feelings. Everyone's like, yeah, I, I don't feel, you know, I feel like a fraud. I don't feel like I'm a real mm-hmm. creator or creative or an artist, whatever. Um, but so, you know, whenever I hear from someone like yourself, who I admire uh, greatly, that I inspire you, that's just, you know, that's just so nice. I feel like it's Friday afternoon and it's only... Yeah, Actually, I don't know what day. We'll, we'll there, convert right? this to a bear stream. <laughs> oh yeah, maybe. We'll, yeah, we could do that. <laughs> um, but no, I, I I do genuinely think uh, you know seeing your work, it's it's always impressed me from the beginning. But over the last few years, um, just seeing it evolve, and maybe it's you changing location as well, has just kind of like sparked a, an interest in things and um, different camera tech has just got you excited in various things. But it, it's noticeable. Um, it, it has become like camera tech does evolve at a crazy pace and it does allow you to make more things specifically for me for time lapse <clears throat> to give an example of how tech or, or the evolution of, of technology and software, I guess, is a big part of it. But mostly the biggest part there. Um, a holy grail time lapse is when you shoot a sunset or a sunrise where you have to shoot manually and, and manually adjust your settings because there's more sunlight hitting the scene and you've got to adjust your exposure because the brightness changes and then you get these zigzag flickering pattern when you make a video out of it so you gotta counteract that with custom time lapse software i don't have to do that anymore Mm. because the cameras i use now have this exposure algorithm built in where i can tell it like hey you're gonna start shooting an hour before sunrise tomorrow and you're also shooting a sunrise so make sure there's no flickering and that you gradually adjust the white balance yeah and your shutter speed and your uh, and your iso and the camera's like yeah sweet and i'm in bed snoring and every morning i wake up with my cup of coffee, I walk to on my balcony and I check this morning sunrise. It's like Christmas every day. Nice. And that is new. Like that wasn't ever really an option a few years ago. Well, that must you make had it to get up easier. at 4 a.m. every morning and go and so this gives me so much more footage now to work with. Like mm. sunrise is still, you know, they're so cool. <laughs> you know, how the light hits and, and unexpectedly you can see shapes or movements in clouds and stuff. Um, that's yeah. So in that sense, like technology evolves and allows me to 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 create more or different footage. Yeah. I mean, that that's sort of the the best process of a bit like working efficiently and creating the workflows that just allow you to focus on that creativity. Your tools are now doing that for you, which allows you more time, I'm sure. Yeah, uh, totally. To plan and yeah, to check and the weather and to sleep. And, to, you and know, also just, num- you know, it's a numbers game, right? Like there's only X amount of really great sunrises a year mm-hmm. before you had to pick your battle and pick your time. Uh, and now I can shoot every sunrise. I should probably commit like a sunrise a day for a project, but yeah. I don't want to put extra pressure on me because I'm just, I'm just getting out of a, a little mini burnout Yeah, because of putting too much pressure on myself. So yeah. Yeah, we'll no, I, I think that's a, that's a smart move. Um, but also, I mean, one of the greatest narratives of being a time-lapse photographer is you're playing to the world's time. You know, that in itself is finite. Um, and you can use that as a guideline to sort of work with. And, and um, one area that I do want to talk about, actually, is the gold that you have struck uh, with this flat that you moved into. Um, you can't see it from so... here, but... What's what I find kind of uh, kind of brilliant about this is during a time when we're spending so much time at home, you have managed to move into a home that has multiple vistas World across London. Views. Uh, and you're calling this the Cloud Palace. That's it. It's, That's it. It's just. Such, I don't actually know how like I came up with the Cloud Palace as a name. Maybe someone suggested it. And initially, I was like, "Oh, that's a bit, mm, maybe a bit airy." But no, it's legit. I am staring at the clouds all day long. So backstory, I have lived in shoebox sized flats for the last couple of years. I've lived in major cities in Sydney, which is terribly expensive to live. Uh, I moved there from Belgium because I met a girl there. And then that girl eventually is like, hey, I want to live in London. And I was like, cool. I just moved <laughs> and built up a whole career in a network. And, and now you want to go to London was like sweet I don't know anyone there I don't have a professional network anyways because of the cost of living etc we've lived in some really really tiny flats as I'm sure many many people are familiar with and because of the pandemic and we had the foresight that there will likely be another lockdown this shoe size flat we had in a great area in London a lot of nightlife great transport connections for weekly city trips and travels uh, all of that's gone so quality of life goes down where we worked on a small small table for five months together she's a lawyer i'm this you know creative photographer whatever um i don't know how we did it but mm. eventually i think our lease or our, our what do you call it contract was coming up 
so we wanted to move we're like we winter's coming we need more space it's it's depressing as hell like we a view from the window um people that follow my instagram stories for a while they know what that view was like it was the back side of a hotel a gray wall we could barely see the sky like a small strip yeah. of sky was visible um it reminded me of uh like faulty towers or mr bean where you just open the curtains it's just a brick wall <laughs> it was pretty much like that <laughs> And then uh, we we struck gold. We got so lucky. Uh, the guy that was doing the the flat, getting people to come through to to look at the flat. I was like, you know, we're looking for a two bed so I can have my own office, like my own streaming and editing studio. Um, and he showed us this flat, and he's like, you know, this. And still to this day, and we've been here now for almost or just over six months. I'm like, what's the catch? There's mm -hmm. got to be a catch. Yeah. Um, we have been so lucky. This flat is an absolute dream come true. And it's changed, you know, part of my career as well, because if I didn't have this, I wouldn't have all this time lapse content. I wouldn't have all these views. So we've got as the, the view you just showed is the view looking, uh, what is that? South uh, East, I guess, or East ish Canary Wharf. Yeah. We also have a view of the city of London, the square mile. Uh, and then we've got a shared rooftop and we, I mean, we have 360 degree views. I mean, you've got uh, so many views, like, uh, it's one thing to have one great view, yeah. but to have multiple views, just Visible. I'd be happy with just to see to be able to see the clouds. Mm -hmm. I would be happy with that. But it's... we get everything. So and a, and a balcony as well. And Lots not only that, but you've got windows that open so wide. <laughs> I've never seen a Weird window windows, yeah. wide enough that you could like have a bear climb through. Not that we get bears <laughs> in central London, but yeah. um some bears. Yeah, yeah, it's it's just incredible. So in, at a time when we're all at home, you've been able to bring your work home quite literally. Yes, you've brought the clouds into your home. Um, yeah, and now interesting this amazing space that has had a downside. Now, and it's not the catch that I was talking about earlier, but it has turned me not into a lazy person, but into someone or like I mean, I can just shoot this view every day. I mean, look at that. Mm. That's fantastic. That's shot. And I'm just staring out and I'm shooting like four or five cameras at the same time. I'm running around like a madman doing, you know, vlogging and stories and shooting also the other side of the sunset because that was a banger, that one. But I feel like this view is so good that I'm less inclined to leave. I mean, also, it's been a freaking, you know, pandemic lockdown. So I've been quite safe with that staying at home mm -hmm. most of the time. But um, yeah, the, the urge to go out and shoot is kind of gone mm. um which i guess makes sense when you have views like that but it does lead to less footage like i've got a lot of the same shots yeah and i'll eventually make a video of like showing how we um turn around the sun and how the the earth um or the axis you know moves through the seasons mm. because the sun rises there close to canary wharf and now it's rising almost out of view way way to the left of what you're seeing there do you find uh, that um you've set your cameras up into specific locations and they just stay there like do you ever pretty much i've got clamps you... i use the okay Manf manfrotto k clamps or super clamps i think they're called super clamps yeah and then i just pop a ball head in there with a, a spigot or whatever you call it and they're pretty much there 24 7. so if you find a new view say in the distance and you think right I've, I've now got this super zoom like you bought the the nikon p1000 i think it is um yeah. and you know, you, you found this new view with a super zoom. Do you then buy a new clamp and just continue to add to it because you don't ever want to change? <laughs> no, it's, I mean, the clamps, setup. they change a lot. And sometimes, um, sometimes I need them in my office. Great clouds, these Mementos clouds, mm -hmm. booby clouds. Um, sometimes I set them up in my office because we're on the, you know, a, a higher floor. There's a bit of wind. When you're shooting with long lenses, you really want it to be as stable as possible. And when you put it on the balcony, the wind can really affect. I mean, the P1000 shoots at 3000 mil on, on the long end, which is, you can't, if you, you it, it'll pick up your heartbeat mm. <laughs> and, and shake the whole clip yeah. or the footage. Um, so yeah, that sunrise is close to Canary Wharf and now it's not even close. It's really moving. Um, so the clamps move around, but they're so easy to set up. You just, li I mean, literally clamp. And then I use um, Peak Design straps and I've got them, I've got those little, um, I don't know what you call them, these things. The, as a yeah, the quick release security things. safety yeah. mechanism they just kind of latch on but yeah the 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 safety clasps are there constantly the clamps move around a bit um we recently discovered that we have a view of the uh the emirates skyline near the o2 i found that randomly while editing a time lapse i um 
like what's that what's that stuff moving <laughs> turns out it's also a view but yeah we need a long lens for that yeah definitely um but yeah so, it's 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 fantastic it's definitely like if i didn't have this i don't know what i would have been doing the last couple of months because i'm pretty much shooting it at least the time lapse a day and on mm -hmm. a good day when there's like a, you know one of those storms hitting or when there's a, a nice sunset um i'm shooting like i don't know thousands of images mm -hmm. every day if so, I, I did this on the street i did a stream with cvp yesterday if anyone's watching who's involved with like a hard drive company or a storage manufacturer the organization Still let me searching. know <laughs> yeah that, that's one thing I, <laughs> I want to kind of question about actually is so the more the more cameras that you get involved with uh the more gear the more tech you know you you've got multiple different brands now i think you're quite similar to me in being agnostic to camera brands um whichever works best that, that must moment. just be such a headache deciding you know for one which camera is the right camera to use for a, a time lapse that you're battling mm. against the time you know, you're chasing the light, you're doing all of these things. You're, you're also chasing memory cards around your room, I imagine. Um, I have this little pile, actually, I'll show you here. This is the good to go pile. Right. And whenever I'm done shooting, I'll put the ones on the left or the need to be offloaded pile. There's actually more there. But yeah, it's constant. Like just that was probably, I don't know, over a terabyte in SD cards <laughs> just sitting, sitting there. Um, it's mad. Yeah, you, you uh, yeah, like need which to get camera you choose server overhaul definitely yeah i need something good and like my current backup strategy is, is lazy as well like i'm not backing up everything there's also just so much stuff i've started deleting footage i never advocated for deleting clip uh time lapse raw files because storage is cheap mm. um but it adds up when you're shooting at you know thousands of photos every day yeah for a whole six months or more um yeah but to go back to like which cameras to choose or which like i've got i'm either shooting on a on a Lumix or on a Canon, I've been a, I'm a lifelong Canon shooter. Uh, that's always kind of been a recurring thing. Uh, and I've done a lot of work with Canon Australia when I was there. Haven't really gotten in touch. I mean, I, oh no, actually I did shoot with the R6 here, thanks to Canon UK. Mm -hmm. But Lumix UK is, you know, one of the first brands that got in touch with me to work with them when I moved here about two years ago. And I'm so pleasantly surprised with the time-lapse performance mm. on those cameras. So I've got so an good. S1 and an S5 now. And I said this yesterday to some mates, I wonder how many photos I've taken on the S1. I haven't figured out how to check that, but it would be a couple hundred thousand, I'm sure. And mm -hmm. it's a pretty new camera. So <laughs> resale value is gone. <laughs> yeah. So with the uh, with the planning of things, actually, and there was a question in the chat from Carl, uh, of how do you envisage taking a viewer on a journey for a time-lapse sequence? Uh, and to add to mm. that is, you know, where you're, where you're planning and chasing the light, you're chasing the weather, at some point you've also got to think of a narrative and you know the actual filmmaking aspect because it's one thing to yeah. capture the time lapse but also you need to edit some sort of story afterwards how do you yeah. how do you begin planning that that's tricky and and especially because it's a very almost one dimensional style of cinematography right you have the passing of time mm -hmm. in that passing of time the fact that is manipulated is cool because people are like whoa i didn't know clouds moved like that or mm a sunset actually acted in this way where it seems like there's two color bursts um, or that a sunrise can have these crazy, you know, rays and stuff. That's mostly, you know, visually it's, it's an appealing thing. And that's what mostly I rely on is to wow people with just the visual aspect of it. But then to try and craft a story with that, I've started working with kind of like giving a bit of context in some of my short time-lapse films where I think the cloud palace has a, uh, couple of black uh, interest screens with text where it's like, I've waited my whole life to live in a place with a view. Uh, and we finally got it just gives a little bit of context, a little bit of meaning as to like, why, like, why am I looking at, you know, two angles times 30. <laughs> but um, it helps. And also like the people that follow me, they know how much time goes into it. And maybe mm. that's another aspect that people like to see or witness is just how much time and energy and, and knowledge, I guess, about the the that niche uh, goes into creating this type of footage, which I think is also detrimental. Like, I've been thinking a lot about you know TikTok and new platforms and reels, and why don't my very best, very special, most special time lapse clips perform well? Mm. Because people in the know they know that they're incredibly hard to shoot or used to, and that there's lots of editing involved and Someone not in the know sees, well, that's a cool sped up video. Whoop, yep. swipe past. 
Whereas when I post a clip of my streaming setup or, or my office or my cameras, people are like, oh my God, literally I have I a reel that I posted yeah. right before I left Instagram for a few weeks. That reel's at 25,000 likes and 550,000 views. Mm. My best performing piece of content of the last 10 years across all platforms. And it's a, I don't want to swear, it's a freaking video clip <laughs> shot on my phone and uploaded with no context, nothing, just yeah. panning around my office. Yeah. Why is that? And I think it's because people don't realize how much time goes into the time lapse. I'm also not blaming anyone. That's I think a, it's, just, it's just natural. That's an interesting point, actually. It's kind of similar. Um, so one thing that I've noticed in myself, uh, a lot of my closest friends are people that I've either uh, went to uni with, people that I've worked at various companies for or other creators. And the common thread across all of my closest friends are they're people that I've been in an environment where I've been working and people have seen how I work and, and what I work on. And I feel like that's actually just such a, a characteristic value thing. And likewise, back to them, I've I've been in environments where I've seen them work and I see their dedication. Um, and I, I find that really admirable when you see someone who's dedicated to their work and I, I want to become, you know, close friends with them. So seeing yeah. that, whereas if I then, if I just saw their, just their work and they make it look super easy without seeing yeah. the behind the scenes, I don't have as close That's a connection. It, making it seem super easy. Yeah. But so much experience and energy and knowledge goes into, and you don't have that context if you're just consuming mm. stuff on in real life or on a platform yeah. uh, that, that just like bombards you with stuff constantly. Um, that's why I think real life clips less, you know, more rough, more raw, less edited stuff does better because it feels more relatable mm -hmm. to people like, Ooh, I could do that. Um, or that's within reach. Mm -hmm. And, and it also has a, maybe a more direct line into there. Like, Oh, I know kind of how that works or what that must be like to create or something. I don't know. Mm. It's just, it's something that I've, I've been thinking about for years, but I think recently I, I just kind of had a, an epiphany and I see a lot of people, um, a lot of my peers, fellow time lapsers do the stuff they're sharing their best time lapses and, and their best clips. And I know, and you would know, and, and probably the viewers would know as well. Like that's very special mm -hmm. what you're sharing there, but you're getting five views on TikTok. Yeah. Yet, you know, you can show literally anything else and it will get more views. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, but this you is, know, how do you leverage the whole that? Thing. Like, let's use that to, to then uh, game, game the system. So I, my new context, my new approach is also showing myself because uh, I've got a personality and that's the whole reason I started vlogging years ago. It's like, I'm a likable person. I, you know, I, I perform well on camera and if I could show myself and a little bit, a little bit of the kit and I can be like, I shot this on a 170 pound camera. I bought this secondhand. It's Lumix FZ82. Here's the cool stuff you can do with it. That straight away has got many more views mm -hmm. than the actual stuff that I shot with it. But because I'm showing the camera like this plant that I used to have in the back here, it's so dramatic. It's mm. a Calathea plant or whatever. If you don't water it for a, like, forget to water it for a day or two, it just droops I'm like, oh, it's dead. The leaves curl up. Yeah. Then you give it a bit of water. And I shot that with this. And like that straight away got so much more engagement. Mm. Yeah. And I'm, again, like I want to hammer, I want to make this very clear. It is not about the engagement. The point is not to get many likes or views or, or followers or numbers, anything. Uh, the point should be create stuff that you love. And if you're lucky, you'll find people that love the same and you might get a following. Um, and it's so easy to get caught up in it because it's a manufactured system by these platforms, obviously. I mean, I'm sure you've talked about this with many people. Um, but this is one thing I've not really spoken about on the channel ever. I, I never really discuss much of the the sort of behind the scenes. And one of the things that I'm I'm having to take on board and, and learn myself as I've uh, spent most of the start of this year just really analyzing the way that I'm essentially running this as as a business and, and looking mm -hmm. at the things and where I get my enjoyment from and where I need to just, you know, tweak a few things that make sense from a business perspective that allow me, uh, I always think of this famous uh, Walt Disney quote, it's like, we don't make movies to make money. We make money to make more movies. And oh, love that. it stands out so much of there yeah. are times when you do need to just pull a few levers and just make a few things work and tweak so that you can generate that income so that you can then go on and make the work that you want to do and, and share that passion. Uh, and it just yeah. takes a few tweaks. And one of those that I've been sort of realizing myself and, and making plans for and hoping to be more open about is just sharing the journey, being open to sharing when things go wrong 
when things mm -hmm. uh, have technical difficulties, when those, you know, yeah. things just like your fail. intro bit. Yeah, the, yeah. the vulnerability, because it's, yeah. it's something that I'm uh, a, a true perfectionist uh, in the sense yeah. of I will continue to tweak and tweak and always yeah. adjust things and make to the um, point that you don't like that you're a perfectionist because you know it's taking uh no i, I do, to do I, things i enjoy it like, it's it doesn't okay. stop me from publishing like there are other yeah. people who call themselves a perfectionist but they actually never start um so it's it's one of those things <laughs> yeah. where i will just return to it uh so i'll do something and i'll continue to tweak it and improve it on the next time improve it on the next time um yeah. but quite often i i do a, a large amount of that up front and then i share it and people weren't there for the journey so of course they're yeah. not as attached to it as i was uh, and i think again the same... that comes back to that they don't know what goes on behind it and there's exactly. less of that connection with it yeah yeah um and, and it's reckon... happened multiple times like when um you know even just doing this live stream setup is something that i'd been tweaking and, and making and having a lot of fun with and i got plans for it but i never really spoke about it release a video about my live stream setup and People don't really care too much because they're like, "Well, you don't live stream." It's like, "Oh, no, I, I'm." That's I've been coming. working on this for a year. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's you know it's taking yeah. those cues and uh, I mean yeah. I've been doing this six years now or so. I think you've been doing it slightly longer. Mm. Um, and yeah, you, you know, always learning with it. But the the main yeah. thing is that the passion's still there. Um, yeah. And yeah. And that, and that's it's painful when you when you push yourself too hard, be it you know could be caused by perfectionism or or the pressures of social media and having to create constantly um it's so painful when you lose that passion or that drive or that energy mm -hmm. because you push yourself too hard to the point of failure and then you just think you know you gotta you gotta like reboot and it can take a while yeah uh, which is something i've went through recently just yeah start of the year all these ids fucking spreadsheet on the wall <laughs> things to tick off push yourself too hard reach a couple of goals and then boom you feel empty and 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 I've actually been told by a few separate people, they're like, you have a lot of traits of ADHD. Did you know that? I was like, no, I did not. I mean, I always had a suspicion, but now I'm actually looking into it. Uh, mm -hmm. and I think <laughs> knowing that might, might change my approach to things. But um, yeah, it's just learning how to deal with things. Um, I, I didn't realize you didn't know that. I, that's something that I'd kind of wondered <laughs> as well myself. Uh, not for me, but for you. Yeah, um, well, I mean, I have my own for another live stream, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I have my own thoughts on, you know, I've always wondered, um, or especially in the last five years or so, uh, if I have elements of autism, um, yeah. there are just certain things that just, when you look into it and it's kind of, you know, raised a few flags of those, yeah. those are traits that I have. Um, yeah. and, and it's tricky cause like it, everything's on a spectrum, like literally mm. everything in life, um, but so much in life is, is ruled by systems that are black and white or they try to be black and white and put mm -hmm. you in a box and stuff. So I don't know. It's interesting. And, I, and I'm glad you um, you talk about that as well. Again, what I wanted to say earlier, talking about like the struggle and the, the behind the scenes and evolution of projects or building stuff makes it all the more relatable. Mm. And then it's almost like it's almost like a cheat, like a hack of being it for creators, be more raw and real. That's the, the reason Instagram stories um are so successful is because it gives you an insight into who this person yeah. really is and one of my uh best performing highest engaging videos ever is when i opened up about my struggle with anxiety and depression years ago honestly that was like a cheat in the whole game of youtube yeah because <laughs> people relate so much more and you become so much more likable and i was like damn this has nothing to do with my channel you know i'm a time lapse photographer i share how to time lapse and and i share my work and, and tips and this and that never talked about mental health on there and since then i realized you know i want to make it a point to be more open about that because mm. it is relatable for people i feel more at ease because people understand the struggle i also help other people because they're like not everyone you see online is perfect or has got it all together and and so now this adhd thing and you maybe being the, with the with the aut autism like it's good people need to do more of that it's mm. it's oh my god i'm so tired of the perfect the perfect um influencers and the people that never talk about their struggles yeah. um and i was at one of the last conferences i was at last year or two years ago now i don't know times a blur was um uh vit summit in la and peter mckinnon was there he was doing one of the big talks and you know I, i've got a lot of respect for peter mckinnon but i always felt like i, I was missing something i was like i need you to be a bit more real and that mm. talk he did he opened up about how he had a panic attack and my uh, respect levels for him were already pretty high 
but they just shot through the roof because I was like, you finally like opened up. A human. I don't watch all of his content, but that for me was like a big, big moment to see mm. one of the biggest or most hyped up creators that everyone's trying to be open up about like the struggles of, of, of mental health and the struggle of being a creator of that size. And so, yeah, we, I think we need more of that yeah. pretty much. Yeah, Maybe definitely. Belgian waffle ramble here, but uh... <laughs> <laughs> I love the Belgian waffle term. Um, no, I think it's uh, it's definitely it's great to chat about, and and that's why I enjoy chatting with you about things uh, like this because you know we we do have similar backgrounds. We're in similar locations. I mean, you're the other side of the city to me, and yeah. um, you know we we share the same weather most of the time. <laughs> like there's there's a lot that's shared, um, yeah. and you know it, it's. Uh, the same week uh, as last week when I was talking with James Popsies, it was very similar um, and very relatable. And it's it's really uh, calming to hear that from yeah. other people. And um, I think that's something that I want to kind of share more with the audience. So uh, yeah. it's, it's great to have that. Nice. Uh, just to kind of bring the chat back um, to some time lapse and photography things. One thing that what, we're talking about time lapse. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> One thing um, uh, I always find with uh, your time lapses is you're you know capturing hundreds, if not thousands, per sequence. Within mm -hmm. those, there are so many gems of Ooh. just pure photography. Yeah. You know, take a for example, foggy scenes like this. Yeah. Um, and you know that is a an epic view. Uh, great light, great foggy um, view of things. Fogged but, up lens as well. I don't know if you can tell, but that lens fogged up because of the uh, the dew point. And then but, a moment uh, later, you've got the same scene, the same framing, uh, yeah. but a different emotion, different lighting. And mm -hmm. how do you how do you pull yourself away from saying, you know, I'm a time lapse photographer. Um, I'm not making prints and stuff. I mean, this could be a, a side project of doing prints and uh, you know photography specific mm -hmm. things, and people not realize that oh, there's actually a whole thousand other images that follow this yeah it's a thing that i've thought about for the, since the start of my career or even before um obviously what i do is a complete hybrid of photography and video like is time lapse photography is that is that video is that videography or is it photography i'm making photos no i'm taking photos but i'm making videos you know what i mean mm -hmm. uh, so if you're unaware you create time lapses out of sequences of raw files because you have better resolutions, dynamic range, control over your image, et cetera. Um, if you were to do that with video, you would you know, burn through. That's one of my favorite cloud structures I've ever seen, by the way. Um, epic. If you do that with video, you run through your battery and your storage, et cetera, uh, like crazy. The thing, like I've been doing time-lapse for over a decade now, I think, and I see them, I, I look at the end result. And last Friday I was streaming, um, and how my streams usually go is I, I review that week's time-lapse footage. Like right now, I've got a 24-hour shot running on a GoPro so I can talk about the, the weather right before we started streaming. That's something I do now from Thursday to Friday. It's like run some clips so we can talk about it and review some of the footage of that week. And so I show these rendered or these almost rendered videos. And one of the sequences from the last stream was um, a, a it was shot at a, a, a large interval. So the sequence moved really quickly. And I was like, oh, what an absolute shame. I don't, I don't have the right interval for this because these are, I suspect asperitas clouds, which are really special. You don't see them a lot. I was like, oh, what a shame. The speed of this video is, it's too fast. Like I can't make a, the, this is perfectionism coming in again. I can't yeah. make like the perfect um, <laughs> time-lapse video sequence out of this. And then while I was saying that, I realized like, Matt, shut the hell up. You have some incredible photos of the sky in high resolution as a raw file from this whole sequence that you can make a couple of really nice prints of from these rare clouds. Mm. So I totally sometimes forget the fact that the stills that I'm creating, the stills that I'm, I'm taking to make these videos are quite special in itself. Um, now, the reason I've never looked at prints and stuff is because first of all, it's too much, it's a daunting, it's a mountain of work. It's quite daunting for me to think about how am I going to do that? How am I going to quality control and ship? And where would I sell it? So I've always kind of like put it off, like not, not now, not for now. I also don't want to devalue my own work. In my mind, there is a universe or a dimension where later on in my life, I do galleries and I spell uh, or I sell special one-off or, or you know small batch uh, prints. I don't want to devalue that potential future mm. uh, work by selling $50 prints right now. Mm -hmm. No disrespect to people doing that. Obviously that's a great way for a lot of people, it really works. But I also don't really feel like what I'm shooting or what I'm capturing is 
worth that right now. Like yep. if I had to choose five stills from the last few years, I'd be like, oh, I don't really know. Like if I had to mm. sell this for a lot of money, I'd be like, oh, I don't really even know which ones I would choose. Like I'm still kind of finding my way. And I know that once life uh, settles down again, because we're unlikely to stay in London forever. But once we find our, our forever home, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll start thinking of bigger projects. And a very big inspiration for me is um, Murray Fredericks. He's 51 years old, I think, from Sydney, Australia. And he does what I want to do later in life, which is big, months-long time-lapse projects mm. or, or visual. It's, it's true art. Um, and I've been to a couple of his galleries, and they're the most incredible photos, um, which are often stills from time-lapse sequences, and he sells them you know, one and a half meters wide, they sell for 20 or 50 K. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just fantastic work. Um, he's the only person that I ever froze up with. I don't, I don't get starstruck easy. I've met, you know, a lot of famous people. Um, but this person like, yeah, I just froze up. I was like, I'm such an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, stuff, stuff like that. Eventually selling stills, I think is probably in the, in the long-term future. Yeah. And it's going to be a pain to find all those files. Oh, it's gonna man. Be very annoying. Well, that's where you know putting the legwork in on organizing it now will will set you up mm. for future success. Yeah, which I feel like you, is something that we also have in common is that that need for efficiency and, mm -hmm. and file management. Um, that's something that got drilled into me at film school. It's the one thing you should take away is be efficient with your file names. Yeah. And they actually had this mantra or whatever they call it. If they found an untitled file on your computer, like your workstation at school, they would just delete it. Mm -hmm. But if it doesn't have a proper title, it goes in the bin. Yep. Even if it's your thesis, your end, whatever, your master's, Get in the doesn't bin. matter. If it doesn't have a proper title, it's gone. Love and it. they'll come out and look for it. This is, you know, 12 years ago or whatever, um, or more. But yeah. That is, uh, that is brilliant. Um, I think that's also a, a great note uh, to end on. So the idea with these streams is that we'll have um, kind of like a, a main sort of show, as it were, uh, where we can discuss um, and then I can trim it down in the YouTube studio afterwards. But Matt, mm. if you're happy to, to hang around uh, and if there's any chats in the, uh, any questions in the chat, um, we can, you know, hang out with those yeah, and discuss sure. those. Uh, but I will just do a little end screen. Um, so stick around uh, after that. And um, yeah, for those of you watching live, you'll get the benefit of hanging out with us for a little bit. That's cool. I didn't know you did that. That's really smart. How well, do you do that? <laughs> I, uh, I haven't done it yet. This is, this is the first time doing it. So Ooh, um, smart. All right, so this is where the video ends. Uh, thanks for joining Matt, and uh, for those watching live, stick around. Bye.